Welcome everyone. My name is Diana Wall and I am the science chair for the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. We're looking forward to seeing you here and also in Dublin, I should say. Uh, we have a series of webinars that we've been running since COVID uh, and we're really happy to have this one today and then we'll kind of close for the summer. I want to, uh, I'm watching the screen here. Um, I want to also just say for the record that we will be recording this video, uh, this, this session, and we will put it on YouTube and you'll be able to see it on YouTube and all our previous webinars, which cover many, section, many uh, different topics of soil biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. So be sure and check those. I, the first thing I wanna do is introduce Byron Adams, who is the moderator for this session, for this webinar, where we're taking a look at soil biodiversity in the Antarctic. Byron has a long history working in the field in Antarctica, and it's wonderful to have him with us from BYU. Byron? Thanks a bunch, Diana. I'm totally stoked to be here to talk about this. Uh, of course, it's something that uh, I've been studying for quite some time. And I'm really excited to present, uh, you know, uh, the results of some of our research, but also the conversations that we can have and, and the Q&A aspects of this. At this point, I'd like to introduce the other folks that are on the panel. Uh, we've assembled an amazing group of people today to talk to you about uh, something that they're experts in. Uh, the the uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my research, but then following my comments, we'll hear from Jasmine Lee. Uh, Jasmine, if you want to pop in and wave your hands, uh, that's going to be super fun. And then after Jasmine, we'll hear from Claudia Colsey. Uh, and, uh, and then <laughs> after Claudia, we'll hear from Jackie Gordial. Jackie. And, um, and then after Jackie speaks, we'll finish up with Gemma Collins. Yeah, so that, right, that's what's in store for you today. So um, uh, I'm really happy to, to, to talk about this kind of stuff. So um, uh, I'll lead off here talking about some of the research that I've been involved in for a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Transantarctic Mountains, the soil biodiversity of Transantarctic Mountains, and uh, some of the uh, patterns that we're seeing uh, associated with climate driven changes in these areas and how the, the soil ecosystems are responding, uh, responding to this, these climate, climate driven changes. And so uh, a lot of my friends, when I tell them I work in Antarctica, <laughs> they, uh, they think that I'm spending all my time walking around on an ice sheet. <laughs> and as a so soil biologist, I mean, what could be more boring than walking around on an ice sheet? Um, it's true that Antarctica is mostly covered in ice, but you'll see that there, there are these regions of Antarctica that are ice free as depicted on this map is these uh, brown uh, patches here that you'll see through the continent. You see some of these brown patches. Those are the ice free regions. And most of my work takes place here and through the Transantarctic Mountains. And those are the areas that I'm gonna talk about today uh, with my research. So this is what the vast majority of these landscapes look like. You'll notice uh, they're completely devoid of vascular plants. In fact, there's pretty much not much alive above ground. Occasionally see patches of mosses, uh, a few lichens, uh, but most of the life that uh, persists here are in these uh, dry soils. Um, but there's also these ephemeral melt streams and some occasional wet patches and some melt ponds. And then these permanently uh, ice covered lakes are also here. Uh, but, the, but I'm primarily gonna be talking about the biodiversity of these dry soils in these ecosystems. And one thing that we've noticed about these ecosystems is that they've entered a new climatic phase. So we're starting to see an increased frequency and magnitude of these pulse warming events. And, uh, and for some time now, we've predicted that climate change was gonna result in something like that. And so we always thought, what happens when it gets warmer? And we thought uh, we set up some experiments, some long-term manipulative experiments where we artificially warmed these soil ecosystems and looked at how soil biodiversity responded to this artificial warming. And uh, when we did that, we found that the um, primary responses were not good, right? <laughs> so uh, warming actually altered the soil chemistry quite a bit, uh, primarily by re uh, making these soils drier and harsher and less uh, hospitable, but, but less, less good habitat for, for these organisms that live here. 
Um, but we, what we found is really happening is with these frequent pulse, uh, frequent pulses of warming also produces increased wetting. So you can see here what used to be a, a dry, a completely dry area uh, with these pulse wetting events, you get uh, a, a wetland can appear in what used to be a very dry landscape. And with those, we think that uh, warming and wetting should produce some pretty, uh, uh, pr pretty uh, spectacular differences in the soil biota. And so how are these uh, soil ecosystems responding to the climate driven changes where these uh, areas are getting wetter? Uh, well, we made some predictions about that, uh, and in order to test these predictions, we turned to some data that we've been collecting for over 30 years uh, in these three different valley systems. So in these valley systems, we've got some transects uh, uh, that are set at low, medium, and high elevations in these three different valleys in Taylor, Mears, and Garwood Valley. And we go back to them every year, and we collect soil samples. And we look to see how the soil biodiversity is responding to these to, to uh, just climate driven changes, right? So climate in this experiment, in this experiment, the driver, the disturbance is climate and the response is soil biodiversity. And so we make some predictions about this. In this ecosystem, there's a nematode worm that's the dominant animal across the landscape in the soils, and it likes it cold and dry and salty, and it's very abundant. But as these ecosystems get warmer and wetter, we would predict that this species would probably decline in abundance and also contract its uh, distribution across the landscape. Whereas some of these other animals, soil animals that like more mesic habitats, like the tardigrades, the rotifers, and some other species, species of nematodes, we would predict that they would become more abundant uh, and, and expand their range across the landscape. So that, that's our prediction. And so uh, <clears throat> we've sort of plotted this out. So here's the dominant species that's uh, found most commonly across the landscape. We predict as it gets warmer and wetter that it's going to decrease in abundance across the landscape. Uh, but these more mesophilic species, we think they should increase over time. And as they increase over time, the communities overall should become a little bit more homogeneous, right? So right now, where the soil habitats are a little bit more mesic, you see uh, there's uh, uh, all of these, these are uh, the most uh, 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 highest biodiversity is in these mesic habitats, but the vast majority of these organisms uh, are in these harsh landscapes dominated by a single nematode species. But we predict in the future uh, that these uh, less, uh, more mesic species should become more dominant across the landscape and that the uh, overall uh, uh, community of these uh, ecosystems, the, uh, the community of organisms in these ecosystems should become uh, more homogeneous overall. And uh, I, I was looking at our data just in spreadsheet forms, uh, you know, it's long term data going back 30 years or so. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it. And I'm thinking, ah, I don't really see any trends here. Um, but fortunately for us on our research team, uh, uh, Walter Andriuzzi, uh, uh, a soil ecologist and a polymath, said, well, have you thought about maybe uh, structural equation modeling or looking at the data more carefully? Of course, I hadn't. I was like, uh, no, hadn't thought about that. Why don't you take a crack at it? And so Walter started exploring these data. And one thing that popped out immediately was the significant uh, decreases in the abundance of this uh, species of nematode that's dominant across the landscape that likes it cold and dry and salty. And you can see the overall trend is one of a downward trend, but that it's especially pronounced at high elevations, right? And um, but the subordinate taxa, those taxa that are found infrequently, those mesophilic taxa, are increasing in abundance uh, uh, across the landscape, right? So we are finding that. Um, but the community, which started out very heterogeneous, is starting to become more homogeneous. So, so th what these communities looked like in terms of their community composition from 1993 to 1999, right, that, that, that's becoming more homogeneous over time at all three of these elevations. So we're starting to see an increase in homogeneity in these uh, uh, in these communities, but uh, we're not seeing that overall right the total uh, fauna overall is becoming less abundant over time. 
And so uh, these, these patterns are consistent across all of the three different valley systems uh, across all of the years. And it's primarily related to this change in soil moisture. So as soil moisture is increasing, it's changing the habitat suitability, uh, making it more favorable for these subordinate taxa. We're starting to see uh, those taxa increase in abundance across the landscape. But again, the overall uh, effect on biodiversity is, uh, or on abundance is a decrease in the, in the abundance of these taxa over time. All right, so that's, uh, that's my pitch. Uh, that's what I wanted to talk about just really briefly today. Um, and so uh, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, so uh, Jasmine will give us a little bit more of an introduction and background into uh, Antarctic soil biodiversity. Um, take it away, Jasmine. Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully you've got my screen okay there. Uh, it's, lovely, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, as Byron is saying, my name is Jasmine Lee. I am at the British Antarctic Survey and I am a conservation scientist. So uh, like Byron was just kind of saying, I might take us back a step and give us a bit of a background and overview of the climatic changes we're seeing across Antarctica already and what we will see into the future and then kind of leave it to Jackie, Claudia and uh, Gemma to really drill down into some of these impacts on biodiversity. So climate change in Antarctica. I'm sure as you all know, you'll know where Antarctica is and as uh, Byron had a nice kind of picture of it there, but what you might not know is that in parts of Antarctica, we're already starting to see some of the fastest warming places in the Southern hemisphere. And that is especially true in the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the uh, bit of the continent that juts out towards South America there. So it's in the top left in this picture. Uh, in the future, we're expecting these changes to continue. So here we start to see projected changes in temperature and precipitation. So on the left hand side, we've got projected changes in degree days for 2100, uh, where degree days you can think of as kind of temperature in relation to ice melt, uh, which of course is really important in Antarctica because of course as ice melts, then we start to see all these changes as Byron was starting to talk about in terms of water availability and habitat, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, so we expect that uh, by the end of the century, there won't be a lot of change in the middle of the continent when it comes to degree day change. So kind of like a more melting, but around the outside, we start to see quite a bit more and it's quite prominent in the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, we see a similar trend for projected changes in precipitation. So not much change in the middle of the continent expected, but especially around the coastline, we start to see increases in precipitation as, and especially in the Antarctic Peninsula. So what does this kind of look like? Um, these are some headlines just from earlier this year uh, where we started just a couple months ago, we saw a huge uh, heat wave across Antarctica and the Arctic. So we still don't fully understand what caused this heat wave, but what we did see was temperatures in the Antarctic continent. So that kind of middle part of Antarctica that were nearly 40 degrees Celsius warmer than they are at this time of the year usually. So that seems almost impossible, but it means that instead of seeing days of about negative 50 degrees, we can see days of about negative 10. So uh, if things like this start to become more common, then we are gonna start to see quite big impacts on the rest of the world as well. So that's temperature. Uh, what about precipitation? So I was talking about increasing precipitation, but what I didn't mention is that precipitation in Antarctica almost always falls as snow, not rain. Uh, but as the temperature changes and it starts to get warmer, we're expecting there to be more liquid rain as well. So these images are just some uh, messages from colleagues. There are the East Antarctic stations, the Australian stations a couple of years ago, where they not only experienced a seven degree day, which is almost unheard of for kind of continental Antarctica, but also liquid rain. So not only is this starting to happen in the peninsula, but also around the rest of the continent. So what does all of this mean for biodiversity? So we've obviously got those direct impacts on biodiversity, the temperature and precipitation changes, but we're also expecting there to be some indirect impacts. And one of these is going to be on Antarctic ice-free areas. So that, as Byron was saying, uh, ice-free areas form the primary habitat for terrestrial species across Antarctica. Generally, the snow and ice is not suitable for almost all species. And so these ice-free areas, they kind of manifest across the continent as 
scree slopes or like small coastal oases or those big dry valleys that Byron was talking about. When we look at a map of them around the continent, as Byron showed, they're generally situated around the coastline and we've also got those transantarctic mountains coming through the middle there. But today, in terms of how climate change will impact habitat, we're just going to zoom in on the North Antarctic Peninsula. That is where we expect to see the greatest climatic changes in the future. So this is the distribution of ice-free areas in the Antarctic Peninsula today in blue. And this is what we expect to see in the future. So under a uh, kind of mild climate scenario, and the only one that keeps to the Paris climate agreements of less than two degrees warming, we start to see the emergence of some new ice-free area there in orange. Under a more moderate scenario, we start to see quite a bit more new ice-free area. And finally, under a severe climate scenario, we start to see a substantial amount of new ice-free area emerging. In graphical forms, that looks like this. So you can see in the left in blue is the current amount of ice-free area in the Antarctic Peninsula. And on the right-hand side is that kind of severe climate change scenario, RCP 8.5. By the time we get to there, if we get to there, hopefully we never will, uh, we expect that the amount of ice-free area will have almost tripled in the Antarctic Peninsula. Around the rest of the continent, it's a bit, it's not as severe as this, but we will expect there to be some new coastal ice-free areas in other places as well. Another aspect of this kind of emerging habitat is that is in terms of the number of discrete patches. And so you can see in this image that with the more severe climate change scenarios, the number of patches actually decreases. And this might seem counterintuitive at first, but what it means is that these ice-free areas are expanding so much that they're starting to join together. So of course, all of these things are gonna have quite severe impacts on biodiversity. And what might some of these be? Uh, possibly your first thought is, oh, new habitat, warmer, wetter, it's going to be great for biodiversity. And you'd be right, there are definitely some species, as Byron was getting to already, that will benefit from these changes. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't fully understand what all of these impacts will be just yet. And I'm sure some of the others will tell you a bit more about those. But we do know that they're going to be diverse. So we're expecting to see increased connectivity with these patches joining together. And this could lead to increasing opportunities for movement of species. So not only will native species potentially be able to move around more, but also non-native species. So there'll be um, more water, it'll be warmer and wetter. This of course will lead to opportunities for both native and non-native species as well. And then on top of all the habitat transformations and the direct and indirect kind of climate change impacts, we've also got something else going on and that is growing human activity. So human activity in Antarctica, both science and tourism is increasing at the moment and we don't expect this trend to stop. So it's also, we have to consider how this will impact our species and kind of act synergistically with climate change. Whereas humans are definitely one of the biggest transporters of non-native species around the continent, for example. So all of these things are things we need to kind of consider more moving forward. Uh, one of the big challenges that look working at a broad scale across the continent is that the data deficiency in some areas is very severe. So we know quite a lot about certain places like the McMurdo Dry Valleys where they've got like a long-term ecological research project, but other places we know barely anything. So these are all things that have to be considered moving forward when we're talking about what we can do and if there is things we can do. So just to get back to the biodiversity, finally, um, we're talking about winners and losers and who is the most vulnerable. And this is some of our recent work that kind of looked at the impacts of climate change on different species across the Antarctic continent, including breeding seabirds. And what we found is, of course, that our beloved emperor penguin is the most vulnerable species and potentially the only one that might go extinct. But on top of that, we start to see those other specialist groups, like Byron was saying, the dry soil nematodes and uh, potentially other um, uh, macroorganisms and things like that, also vulnerable to climate change. But down the bottom, there's also a whole range of species that might also benefit. So it's not a black and white kind of image. There's lots of gray areas and we're not sure exactly what will happen, but it is certainly an exciting field and that we will know a lot more soon. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from the others. So I'll let that go there. Thanks a lot, Jasmine. Uh, that's totally cool. But brings us right up to, to, to speed here for our next speaker. So uh, Claudia, wanna take it away? 
uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today, thanks for listening to us. So my name is Claudia Kulesi, I am from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland where I'm part of the Global Change Institute in the School of Geosciences. And for this presentation today I'm just prepared for five, like five minutes. I am going to be talking about Antarctic vegetation, the vegetation that we find in Antarctica's terrestrial environment. And this first slide should be just a very quick summary slide highlighting all the changes that are predicted and sometimes already evidenced um, to happen in Antarctica's terrestrial habitat. And you see that there are some regional distinctions to be made, uh, but overall there's a very broad set of change happening. And without going too much into the detail of these, um, I just want to use this slide to highlight that there's a whole set of challenges ahead for Antarctica's um, terrestrial systems. And I study these challenges and the responses of Antarctica's vegetation to these changes. And Antarctic vegetation is very special because in fact, there are only two native vascular plant species and overall the vegetation is instead dominated by these soil dwelling cryptogams. So these are lichens, mosses, cyanobacteria, green algae. And as a community, we refer to these um, as biological soil crusts. Here are just a few pictures for you to imagine how these soil crusts look like in Antarctica. So on the first picture, picture A, you see uh, a typical soil surface. So it's very gravelly. And right between this gravel, there's, you see this little green shimmery thing. And if you look at this under the microscope, uh, under the dissection microscope, this is in picture B, you, it turns out that this is actually a lichen. And if you take the sample, you put it under the microscope, then um, you find also some green algae. So this is in C and with an electron microscope, you might even be able to see some fungal hyphae growing in and around the soil particles. And then the final picture, so in number D, it shows a cross section through such a crust. And I just want to use this to highlight um, for you to imagine the scale of these biological soil crusts. So the little white bar that you're seeing, this is one millimeter. So in fact, these communities, these biological soil crusts are very, very tiny. So when you're out in the stunning Antarctic wilderness, a key problem for us is often to actually find what we are looking for. And the only way of doing that is in camping out, walking for mile after mile and spend lots and lots of time on your knees and with the hand lens in your hand trying to find this very cryptic uh, vegetation. So you might ask what kind of science can be done with this? Well, um, in the fact of uh, in the face of climate change, um, the, the development of any evidence based or progressive conservation policy depends on a robust baseline information. And to create such a, a baseline information, we need to check for evidence of climate change related change. And one measure for this could be a change in the overall vegetation cover, for example. So I just very quickly want to introduce you to this study, which represents the longest record of quantitative vegetation change in Antarctica. It's in East Antarctica, it's um, in, done in Cape Hellet, which is in along the Transantarctic Mountains, as Byron showed us before. And this um, study is based on a map that was produced in 1961 by this American botany professor, Emmanuel Rudolph. And he drew the first detailed vegetation map um, of the vegetation in Cape Hellet. And more importantly, he also put packs in the ground to indicate where exactly he monitored this um, vegetation. And that was brilliant because um, these exact packs were found again in 2004 when a New Zealand team of researchers revisited the site. And they then, with a slightly improved technology, so 
at the time they used um, modern GIS technology, checked um, the vegetation again. And then finally, in 2018, we managed to go and visit the site. And now with the use of modern drone technology and, and machine learning techniques, we could evaluate how the vegetation in this specific plot had changed over the past six decades. And um, much to our surprise, we found that, in fact, the vegetation still seemed to be pretty unaffected by climate change. Actually has been really, really remarkably stable over um, more than 60 years. So consequentially, um, what we're having here is a, a unique opportunity to establish a baseline, a, a sentinel site for, for future change. Um, now, how can we use this research to inform policies on climate change effects? Um, I think there are, there are two answers to that. Um, first of all, I think we need to raise a more wider awareness of um, the slowness of these systems. So they are very slow. Change cannot be detected over an individual year. It cannot be detected over even a season. Um, instead, it, may, it needs decades to detect change and only long-term sustainable studies can provide this. So any policy that aims to protect these systems has to acknowledge that. Secondly, I think it is important for us to recognize that these systems should also have a right of being cold and slow. So often when we speak or when I speak to people and, and, and even some literature, um, speaking about climate change in Antarctica is sometimes referred to as a climate amelioration. So it means it's getting warmer, it's getting nicer, and that means increased productivity, increased growth. And that's a good thing. Uh, I'm not so sure. Um, intuitively, one would say yes. Um, but what all this increased productivity implies for these systems, for the system functionality, that is still pretty much unknown. And I think it's without doubt that these systems are going to change. And all we can do now is trying to capture how, how this change might look like. I hope you found this interesting. If you want to read more, please come visit our webpage at um, cryptogamiacs.geos.ed.ac.uk. Um, I'm also looking very much forward to listening to your questions later on. And thanks for listening. Thanks much, Claudia. That was totally awesome. And uh, just a reminder to everybody that, yeah, we're just doing so these speedy little presentations, but we want to spend the bulk of our time uh, addressing questions in a Q&A session afterwards. So uh, be taking notes and uh, mark down your questions and then we'll, we'll listen, we'll, we'll entertain your questions as soon as we're done. Our uh, next uh, speaker here is going to be uh, uh, Jackie Gordial. She'll talk to us about microbial ecology, microbial biodiversity. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, thanks, Byron. Uh, so hopefully this is all uh, Hopefully you can see this, and if not, uh, someone just give me a shout, uh, let me know. And so thanks for the introduction. I'm really happy to have been invited to, to speak with you all today. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion, uh, especially um, these, these quick speed talks uh, are just meant to be a teaser for these discussions. Uh, so I'm an assistant professor at the University of Guelph uh, in Canada. And today I'm going to talk about uh, microbial life. Uh, in, it, in, in, in Antarctic uh, dry soils. And I would like to just uh, set um, some kind of uh, image, uh, which I think Byron uh, and Claudia both did very nicely um, here. Uh, here's a, an entry from Sir Robert Falcon Scott's uh, diary from 1905, uh, walking through the Antarctic dry valleys. Uh, we have seen no living thing, not even a moss or a lichen. It is certainly the Valley of the Dead. And um, when you look at some of these ice-free regions of the Antarctic, um, at least in the high elevations and, and in some of these other areas uh, that Byron laid out, uh, you don't see plants. Um, you don't see some of these obvious forms of lichen. They are, they are present, uh, though cryptically, in some of these areas. Uh, and this perception that these soils were just dead uh, persisted for quite a long time. Uh, I'm a microbiologist, uh, and of course now we know that these soils are indeed not dead. Uh, there's plenty of microbial life. Uh, it's primarily microbial life, 
Uh, and a large part of how we've discovered that uh, is through using DNA technology. So we can take soil uh, from these environments, extract all of the DNA and get a lot of information about what microbial life persists in these soils, even if we can't visually see them. And I really like studying uh, these soils uh, because unlike our previous speaker, uh, I find vascular plants to be quite pesky. Uh, I really like having these uh, environments where really it's only microbes because this is a really unique natural system on our planet uh, where we can look at abiotic constraints on life as we know it on our planet. So just uh, what are the, the cold temperature limits of life? Uh, what are the water limits of life? Um, and so how do these physiochemical uh, constraints uh, affect microbial activity? Uh, how often a cell replicates uh, in nature? Uh, and what survival skills or what adaptation uh, do these organisms have to survive under some of these conditions? Uh, and of course, these kind of you know, questions are just really fundamental to understanding life on our planet. Uh, but they're also, uh, you know, applicable to understanding life beyond our planet, understanding the limits um, and the edges of life on our planet uh, can help us think about how we might look for it on other planets. Uh, so one of the sites I'm gonna talk about today uh, is University Valley. This is a high elevation uh, McMurdo Dry Valley at about 1800 uh, meters above sea level. Uh, this uh, site and many sites in Antarctica uh, have the presence of something called dry permafrost. Dry permafrost is unique to the Antarctic. It doesn't occur, or at least we don't know of any other sites on our planet outside of the Antarctic where this occurs. Dry permafrost is soil that remains below freezing uh, for at least two consecutive years, but usually longer. Uh, and it also has negligible water content. And so it doesn't have uh, water to kind of bind those mineral particles together to make them hard. It's more like a sand. And that's what you see here. Uh, in University Valley, uh, as you can imagine, these harsh conditions uh, make it really hard for even microbial life. So the biomass in these soils are low, about a thousand cells per gram of soil. So just compare that with, uh, you know, a pot in your home that may have 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 uh, cells per gram of soil. Uh, and because of this low biomass, it makes those DNA technologies to analyze what life lives there uh, really, really difficult. Um, some of you may know that cultivation of microbes in the lab is very hard. We typically miss about 99% of organisms this way. So we really rely on these DNA methods. At sites like this, this is really hard. Um, at this particular site, uh, we know that the microbial populations are really diverse. So when we use our DNA technologies, uh, we get about 1,600 different unique uh, species, uh, or OTU, uh, operational taxonomic units is what we call them, uh, with very few of these species shared between the samples, even if they were taken adjacent by about five centimeters. So really, really diverse and heterogeneous uh, soils. Uh, when we go out into the field and we try to measure uh, any sort of sense of, are these active uh, in soils? Um, are these microbial life, uh, are they active at the in-situ conditions? Uh, so we try to measure uh, gas flux, uh, so carbon dioxide, methane, uh, just any kind of idea that these may be uh, respiring in situ. We don't detect anything in situ. And so we take these samples back to the lab and we carry out very sensitive uh, radio respiration assays. Radio respiration assays are really sensitive. Uh, essentially what you do is you feed uh, a little microcosm or a vial of your soil with a radioactive substance. Uh, if that microbe, uh, much like we do, we eat carbon, we incorporate some of that carbon into our biomass, but we respire some of it out as carbon dioxide. Microbes do the same thing. And so we try to measure the uh, radioactive carbon dioxide that comes out. And we carried out these ex experiments at conditions that are similar to the in-situ conditions, so sub-zero temperatures, uh, all the way up to warmer temperatures that were thawed, so five degrees Celsius. And this is what we found. So at sub-zero temperatures, uh, which these soils would be experiencing in the field currently, uh, we did not detect any activity. We couldn't detect any carbon dioxide coming out off of those soils. When we bump up the temperature to a relatively warm five degrees Celsius, now we start to see activity resume. We can detect that activity in the form of carbon dioxide. So what this is confirming is, you know, yes, these soils are not dead. 
uh, they, they have microbial life that we detect with the DNA and they're remaining viable on really long time scales because the last time these soils uh, saw five degrees Celsius was several hundred thousand years ago. Um, so we know our cells uh, are, are active. When we look at the genomic content, so we're not just looking at the community composition, but really what those functional genes inside of their genomes uh, are, when we look at the communities as a whole and compare them to the, the genomes of other communities from either a surface cold desert soils, so these are other McMurdo Dry Valley surface soils uh, here in the blue, uh, and then other Arctic permafrost soils uh, here in the orange, uh, what we find is that the University Valley permafrost soils are way more similar to permafrost from the Arctic than even adjacent cold surface soils uh, from the McMurdo Dry Valleys. Uh, and the genes that are largely driving these similarities are those having to do with DNA uh, dormancy and sporulation, again indicating that maybe this, these communities tend to be dormant and under warming conditions uh, may become active again. Uh, but, you know, are all these cells dormant at sub-zero temperatures? So we were able to identify or isolate some isolated cultures uh, from these soils. So one of them is the species, Rhodococcus JG3. Uh, this particular isolate or this particular organism is not a spore-forming organism. So dormancy in the form of sporulation for several thousand years is not a reason that we could have isolated this cell from these, um, from these soils. Uh, when we look at its growth, at different temperatures, we do see uh, an increase in activity, metabolic rate uh, or growth rate uh, from a minus five, where it has a very slow doubling time of it divides uh, every 14 days. So we're talking about, you know, slow, slow life here, life in the slow lane, uh, to about every 10 hours uh, when you come up to 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, we could not observe any replication below minus five degrees Celsius. Uh, but when we carry out similar radiorespiration assays, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, uh, we can observe activity down to minus 15 degrees Celsius. So this is an organism that is active at sub-zero temperatures, um, but we couldn't detect that activity in soil. Uh, and what I, want, what I think one of the main reasons that we can see activity in this isolate as opposed to the soil uh, really has to do with water. Uh, so we, when we carry out this incubation as an isolate, uh, these cells are in a liquid media. There's tons of liquid, there's tons of carbon. It's a really happy life. Uh, and so coming back to this idea of climate change, we just had a really great talk uh, talking about all of the changes that we can expect, some warmer temperatures, some wetter temperatures, changing chemistry, uh, all of those things may come to play into having increased microbial activity in some soils, at least. Uh, and in the context of these organisms, when we look at activity, we're looking at an increase uh, in greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide. So we may see an increase uh, in here. I wanted to end uh, on this note here, just to make it not such a clear cut situation, uh, that not all dry permafrost uh, is inhospitable. So I'm currently working on a different site uh, about 2000 kilometers away from the McMurdo Dry Valleys uh, called Elephant Head, uh, named because of this really lovely rock formation. And we're seeing a very different story at this site. So we can readily isolate organisms such as these really cool hyperpigmented uh, looking isolates here. We again, we see really diverse microbial communities when we look at their DNA. But unlike the other soils, what we are seeing is low amounts of activity at sub-zero temperatures. So at minus five degrees Celsius, which is what I'm showing here, it's the same type of assay. Uh, we do see low but detectable amounts of activity already existing at sub-zero temperatures. When we bump these temperatures up to five degrees Celsius, we don't see a difference in the net amount of activity. So the net level of activity as a community is very similar. Uh, currently, we're trying to find out if the communities themselves remain similar or if it's a shift in the microbial members that are responsible for these activities. And I just wanted to end on this note. Uh, we just had this really great talk uh, talking about baselines and sentinels of change. And I think a major challenge uh, from sites like this uh, or from 
some of these extreme and remote sites are really trying to get these baseline measurements. We don't have these baseline measurements yet for many of these sites uh, because of these challenges with studying the microbial life. Uh, and so that's going to be a really big obstacle to understanding how these communities may change with, with uh, a changing climate is we're trying to get a baseline from a moving target in really hard to study systems. Uh, and I look forward to talking about this more in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks a bunch, Jackie. That's all so super cool. Thanks for that. Um, our, our next speaker will be Gemma Collins, and she'll uh, talk to us about uh, more about the charismatic megafauna of uh, these terrestrial Antarctic ecosystems. Uh, Gemma, you want to pop in? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, yeah, unmute. Super. Um, so I'm coming from Zinkenberg, uh, based in Frankfurt in Germany, and um, I'm funded by TBG, which is like an overarching umbrella organization, including six different institutions. And um, the reason I mention this is because we are really interested in developing the genomic methods for a whole wide range of interesting societal relevant topics. But today I'm talking to you um, about the soil invertebrates. And in Antarctica, mm, the largest soil invertebrates are the largest animals that live year round on this ice-free area. And these are the Kalimbala and springtails. The common name is springtails. And you can see here from this photo just how tiny they are. Um, they, it's really amazing how they've been living in this landscape for millions of years since Antarctica was part of Gondwana land. And um, yeah, today there are 10 species that are present across the Ross Sea sector. And each species has a different story and a different distributional range. So today I'm talking about the spatial distribution and picking up on some of the topics that have been mentioned already. So um, these animals are really tiny. They do have six legs, so they can walk around a little bit. But in terms of their long range dispersal across the landscape, they really rely on uh, liquid water being available and so they float like on the surface of the water uh, for example if a glacier is melting and uh, they can be picked up in the stream and floating down or they can also survive uh, on um, salt water so they can float around the coast like from valley to valley and this is one of the key mechanisms that they use for dispersing but the problem is when these water highways are frozen they end up being stuck in place. And here you can see uh, an example of some um, ice-free habitat, potential habitat here for springtails. Um, and then they simply can't get across this glacial barrier. And so what ends up happening is they get um, yeah, stuck or really limited in dispersal based on those abiotic factors and this glacial um, melt and um, yeah, re glacial retreat and expansion over, over the part from the past. And so it's really cool because what you can do is look at the DNA of the animals that are alive today. And it tells you about how long they've been stuck in this place if you compare it to animals from another location. So if, we, um, if I take a springtail from this site and I compare it to this site here, I can look at the percentage difference in their, um, their genomes. Well, for this, um, for this research, we were using uh, like a, a DNA barcode, uh, and this is just a small region of the mitochondrial DNA. So it mutates at a pretty constant rate. And um, in this way, you can date uh, the time that they became separated. And um, yeah, so this is really, the talks that we've seen so far about glaciers coming and going, you can see now how it's affecting these land animals and um, their dispersal. And so what we did is we sampled across the landscape for springtails. And um, here you can see the green dots is where we found some. And this across this whole region, there are six species, uh, but in the gray locations, we didn't find any. Um, and so I guess one idea to mention here is that as the climate is warming and those descriptions that have been provided, maybe we find if we go back here, 
mm, that there might be springtails there in the future at some point. So in terms of that comment about trying to gather the baseline data, that was one of the main aims of the study here was to try and just get this large land scale um, idea of where they are. And um, in a similar respect, uh, it's also really trying to look under a stone, under a small rock, thinking, hmm, if I was a springtail, where would I be right now? It is quite hard to find them in these landscapes, but this study here involved many people, <laughs> Byron, Diana, <laughs> um, and yeah, over many years. And so it was really nice to put this together and you can almost see the South Pole here. So these are some of the most extreme habitats in the world. And so if we are monitoring these places, um, they are responding and very sensitive to changes in climate. And so, yeah, we can, we can see what happens to their distribution. And just to show you super briefly, one thing that we were able to do with this mitochondrial DNA barcode is to um, align their percentage differences with the, what we knew about these ice sheets in the past. So when this whole chunk of ice here melted away um, three to five million years ago, that was the last time that some of these animals were able to float around this coastal region and, and um, be dispersed around these sites. And then when this ice reformed again, we can see like we, we can estimate five million years either, si either side of this small glacier. Um, yeah, there was up to 11% difference in their um, mitochondrial barcodes. And so we estimate this around 5 million years ago, they were last connected. And this is a really small spatial scale for such a large difference. And um, yeah, we have lots of interesting stories for each of these species occurring at a diff slightly different region. And um, yeah, sometimes overlapping and sometimes just completely blocked by these glacial barriers. And so, um, yeah, I can leave it here because then we have more time for discussion. So thanks a lot. Thanks a bunch, Gemma. That's awesome. And so uh, now we've had a chance to, to have each of our uh, panelists kind of throw throw some a little bit, a tiny little uh, flavor of science your way to describe their systems and what they've been working on. So now if you've got uh, questions for any of the panelists and uh, or even some questions in general that you'd like all the panelists to address, uh, feel free to ask those in the Q&A section of the, you'll see down at the bottom of the tab, you'll see there's, there's a Q&A thing there. Uh, type in your questions there. And uh, then uh, we'll be able to see them and then we can can address those questions. And uh, the first one I like to take a crack at is one that uh, Nick Teets has asked here. So Nick's done some work in Antarctica and he's always struck by the heterogeneity that you see down there uh, across the landscape. E even at even small spatial scales, we can see tremendous amounts of heterogeneity there. And he, he's like, whoa, like how do you capture that heterogeneity in your studies? And I'll, I'll take a first crack at this, and then I'll, uh, then I'll extend this to, to the other panelists. But um, that's definitely true in the ecosystem where I'm working in, in the dry valleys. There's tremendous heterogeneity, even across very small spatial scales. And so we, we attempt to replicate our sampling designs and our experiments a lot in order to try and capture that heterogeneity. And then, you know, the truth just comes out when you do your statistical analyses and you see tremendous amount of variation uh, around the means that you co you collect, and it makes it a little bit more challenging to uh, to uh, find statistical significance sometimes in your findings. Um, but that's also really exciting for us too, because um, we make predictions about how increased connectivity or increased hydrological connectivity should break down some of those uh, uh, those barriers, right? And so, in terms of hypothesis testing, sometimes this uh, the tremendous heterogeneity that we see in the system right now can actually be beneficial for us in terms of understanding how these ecosystems will respond in the future. Anyway, that's sort of how I respond to that uh, question, Nick. But I'd like to throw this one out to the other panelists if they'd like to try, Jim you want to take a, a crack at that one yeah i just um maybe i don't have answers but um some other ideas so yeah for sure these micro habitat scales are super important for these small organisms when um the difference between one side of a rock and the other side like that 
small protection you get from the wind and just like a couple of millimeters below the surface or yeah, one stone, you turn over and you find Kalimbala and the stone right next to it, you don't. And it's like, why are they here and not here? Um, but then you see all the shed skins underneath and you think, oh, maybe they were under the stone and now they're under the stone. And it's like these small details that um, when you're first of all looking for them, um, um, and second of all, when you um, are trying to predict, like for example, population size, how, how can you estimate the population size? And I think there's some cool technology coming out now. Like I saw something where you can get a, um, like a thermal camera and point it at a hill just close by and it can tell you like the exact temperature of every little stone. And so, I don't know, maybe this would be useful to then take this photo and then go over there look under every single little stone. I mean, it's this micro detail stuff, but but yeah, a lot of the satellite imagery is getting more and more resolution too, right? Where you can see these changes in the landscape and where the water is. Yeah, I think that's true for, for the vegetation as well. Um, as far as I know, there's currently this idea that the 76 degrees south um, is the, the barrier for the microclimate to be the main driver for the distribution of the organisms. So when we are looking for um, vegetation and heterogeneity in vegetation, then um, we try to capture this microclimate, trying to describe this microclimatic niche, the microclimatic envelope, and, and try to mimic this in lab experiments. And then that can help us to and we scale it up to uh, a larger landscape scale afterwards. If we recognize that within this landscape, it really, it, the, the microclimates are the defining um, a factor for distribution of any vegetation. Yeah, th thanks, Claudia. And, th and just to reiterate uh, what, what Nick's kind of getting at is that often these biota, you know, they don't really care what the average temperature is. They care about what their temperature is, that they're experiencing, their microclimates, the one that matters. And so if we're, you know, extrapolating from mean annual air temperatures or things like that, that really misses, you know, what these biota are experiencing. And, and so, Nick, you've, you've honed in on a, on a key element that makes some of our lab research challenging is trying to trying to present our organisms with a simulated environment, which is realistic to what they'd experience uh, in their natural habitats. Great question, Nick. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's one that challenges all of us, I think. Uh, um, but uh, thanks, for, thanks for that question. It's an awesome one. Uh, um, the, the next question that pops up uh, in our, our Q&A tab here is, uh, comes from Linda Wang, and she's asking a question about, uh, you know, if, I, I, if I'm interpreting it correctly, right? So if we get a global uh, two degree mean annual temperature rise, you know, what does that mean for the organisms in Antarctica? And then how does that have, does that have any impact that we could extrapolate uh, more globally uh, to human population centers and even to human health. And so and that, that's, a, that's a bigger challenge, I think, to, to address. If there's anybody on the panel that wants to take a crack at that one? <laughs> I know, right? We, we don't, like, I don't deal with human health effects very much um, uh, at all. But I think that um, that there is a really important kernel in this question that we do need to address. And, the, and, the, and I get this one all the time, and I'm sure the other panelists do too, right? Where I can say, hey, look at how these organisms responding to climate-driven changes in Antarctica. And, 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 I'm, and the, the populations that I'm talking to are saying like, yeah, cool story, bro. Like, so what? Right, like, what does that have to do with me where I am? How is that going to impact agro ecosystems, or how is it going to impact, you know, my life, you know, in Los Angeles? Right, and that becomes a little bit more difficult. And so, I think, um, you know, uh, that that becomes a challenge for us to address. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, Gemma, go ahead and take a crack at that. Um. So I, my thoughts kind of went down the line of. Um, so globally, we know that the diversity of soil um, is important to humans because uh, like the water storage and the food production side um, 
and also the human health from the microbial side because the interaction of humans and soils um, we know is important for the diversity of the gut microflora of humans but um, like more generally so if you have a lot of diversity in the soil below ground um, it can also be because of the diversity above ground too so if you have these agricultural crops um, above ground and below ground and all of these interactions and I'm kind of mentioning this because in Antarctica the systems are much more simple and if you can study what's driving some specific species then maybe you can then apply this to your more global um, questions yeah, yeah go Jackie um, I'll, and I'll say maybe the word that everyone's hating to hear in the back of their head is pathogen or <laughs> pandemic after this global pandemic. Um, I get this question a lot uh, in the Arctic. So I work in, in Arctic environments as well. Um, and the Arctic has tons of mammals uh, and has had people living on the there as well. Um, and so a lot of pathogens, viruses, um, things like that tend to be pretty adapted for a host, a very specific host. There's, you know, some crossover events and when they happen, it's quite disastrous, <laughs> as I think we're all familiar with uh, these days. Um, but, you know, a lot of these ecosystems that we're talking about didn't have many humans walking around uh, thousands of years ago. Um, and so, I, you know, in terms of pathogens, I would say the risk is quite low. Um, and even in the Arctic, uh, there's there's a lot of evidence that it's it's quite low, not impossible. And there have been there has been at least one incidence in the Arctic, not the Antarctic, of um, a, a potential spread of anthrax uh, from a from a, a possible a reindeer carcass that was unearthed from permafrost thaw. Um, but at least in Antarctic uh, soils, uh, I would say the risk is low. And even in Arctic, I think there's so many more uh, risks associated with climate change, rising sea levels, greenhouse gases uh, that are a much bigger threat to, to human health. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Yeah, an, an important, uh, important consideration to have there. Yeah, um, there's a, another question um, that Laura Zucconi raises, um, and this is an interesting one too, where it seems like a lot of the research that's been carried out in soil biodiversity, we've been focusing on our organisms or our group or our particular habitat type. And Laura's saying, hey, would, would it be really cool to start looking at biotic interactions between these things, like co-occurrence types of analyses, at least to get started, so that we might be able to have a, you know, a better picture of what these soil food webs look like right you know um often in when i write my grant proposals and papers i tend to emphasize how strongly physically driven these ecosystems are right and i like to pretend that oh they're so physically driven that you can just disregard biotic interactions right well that, that's uh that's clearly uh you know not a very good assumption to make and, and so i think that's what laura is 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 calling for uh perhaps some some um some network analyses or co-occurrence types of analyses. Does anybody want to talk to some of those or any, any of you starting to address some of those types of questions? Oh, I'll have a first crack. I mean, I'm not personally carrying out research that's so kind of addressing these questions. I know people like Byron and Diana are, but I think it's a really great point. And it is certainly one of our hypotheses about what we think might happen with increasing climate change is that Whilst a lot of these soil systems are currently, you know, thought to be primarily driven by abiotic factors like water availability and temperature, we do expect that with kind of coming climate that we're going to start to see more biotic components. So I think you're like absolutely spot on there, Laura. Um, though the other one of the other points is that we don't fully understand interactions in these systems already. And I know there has been some new space in like the microbial sector that suggests that they might already be going there might be some more biotic interactions occurring than, than that we were kind of currently aware of. And I know Diana had some recent work that was looking at kind of the potential changes in biotic components within soil kind of food webs and like changes between predator and prey interactions and how these might change with climate and warming. So I think there's absolutely going to be huge changes in biotic systems and um, kind of getting back to what Gemma was saying before is that maybe these will be indicators of potential changes in other systems as well, but we certainly don't have a full answer yet. 
Yeah, I, I will pitch a paper that um, uh, one of my former graduate students just uh, kicked out, which is yeah, does have a network co-occurrence type of analysis to look at the microbes. He, he did it doing you know shotgun uh, genomic sequencing of the soils. And he was able to identify some of these really strong uh, relationships between some of the heterotrophic protists and their bacterial prey items. And he was actually even able to uh, identify like feeding preferences and stuff like that. So I think that's a, a indication of where this field can go and can kind of take these. I mean, it's difficult. You, you can't really say just because they're interacting, you know, just because they co-occur means that they're interacting. That's, that's a little bit of an assumption, but, um, but I think that's an indication of where the field can take this. So pretty exciting so thanks for that laura that's a that's a really really uh, a fertile area uh, of for future may, research may i add an, another another thought on that um which is something that is often um discussed within our um, vegetation group and that's that um interactions are not as obvious as we think. So most what, what comes into mind is competition and predation, but especially in, in these cold environments where everything is really slow, facilitation might be an even more important um, interaction between species. Like when, when, a, when a lichen grows on top of a moss, it benefits from the respired CO2 and has an increased productivity because of that. So it, it seems that facilitation might be something that is of great relevance when we are talking about the functionalities of these of these um, interactions. So um, I just want to raise this flag that if we are considering um, interactions, that um, is not just looking into one direction, but uh, not just trying to develop a food web, but also consider other interactions that might be less obvious. Yeah, awesome. thanks for that. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. Yeah, big time, particularly as we look at ecological succession, right? Uh, Facilitation probably plays a huge role, but often overlooked in our research. Yeah, yeah, right on. Um, Umahani Hasi has a question, a, a general question for all of us, uh, asking about how uh, warming temperature might favor or boost soil organism growth. And the question is, does this increase soil functioning in the near future? And, and is it good news or is it not so great news for us? Anybody on the panel want to take a crack at that one? Uh, just in general, the, the greening of Antarctica is something that uh, a lot of folks are starting to look at and, start, and trying to understand. And of course, you know, in the system that I work in, you know, it's possible that you could get um, increased uh, uh, or organismal growth. You could get increased net primary productivity or you, you could actually get the opposite. Right. You could get decreased net primary productivity depending on where the water is. Right. And where the water goes and things like that. So I think it it really does become habitat specific as to where you're going to get increased increased um, uh, functioning in those soils yeah. and how that works. Because you could actually, you know, with, with increased connectivity, you could get increased functioning or you could get decreased functioning. Uh, go ahead, Claudia, you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, I think that there are some studies showing that um, some gro growth rates of mosses have quadrupled over the last decade or so. So is it, it really seems that there is um, growing evidence that there is uh, um, at least the vegetation is growing faster, it's growing uh, more productive. Uh, but we need to recognize that these soils are most often very deprived of nutrients. So especially when organisms require nutrients for growth, then that might slow down their growth in, in the long term. So there might be an initial boost that we are recognizing right now, but then in the long term, this might not sustain um, and, might, and might not go on. So is uh, we are very uncertain about what the actual um, long-term response of that will be. And I think it's, it's also um, sometimes a bit counterintuitive. So there's one study showing that um, there's actually a negative feedback loop of increased productivity in moss and lichen growth um, in the Antarctic, where then there is similar to what Jackie said before, an increased respiration, so an increased um, um, CO2 development rather than CO2 uptake. Um, from the soil in response to increased productivity. Hey, th thanks for the comments, Claudia. Yeah, cool. I'll just jump in quickly there, Byron, as well. I think um, 
it's, yeah, it's Claudia's talking about like our native mosses and plants. I think there's also been some research done by colleagues at, at Bass and elsewhere looking at like the impacts from non-native species. So there is a non-native invertebrate uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula, a midge, and they know that it has is is increasing litter turnover and things with increasing temperatures. So I think another thing we might see uh, in terms of soil productivity might actually come from non-native species, but of course we don't fully understand these interactions yet and what it's going to mean, but certainly lots to find out. Yeah, uh, hopefully we get a chance to talk about that. Uh, there's a, some more questions coming up about uh, non-native species and how that throws a wrench into things. So I hope we get a chance to talk to that in a little bit. Um, but Cecilia's got a, a question here for Jackie uh, that I thought also was super interesting with the rhodococcus uh, uh, bug that you found there. Uh, do you have some genomic or physiological insights into a mechanisms about how this non-endospore forming bug can do its thing in that particular environment? Yeah, um, so the, the paper that we, we did publish a paper on that uh, in 2016, where we looked at its genome uh, and specifically identified um, a lot of cold adaptive traits, both in terms of what genes were even present, uh, but then also noticing that there were some substitutions at the amino acid level. Um, so we took every single rhodococcus genome from any warmer environment that we could find in a database, and we compared it to this cold adapted uh, organism. And we looked at amino acid composition of every gene that we found in both warm adapted, or war, I shouldn't call them warm adapted in, in these mesophilic rhodococci uh, and ours from the Antarctic. And we found that in uh, many of the genes, uh, there were amino acid substitutions that shouldn't change the function of the protein, uh, but would confer increased flexibility. So if you think at cold sub-zero temperatures, everything gets really rigid, um, just having a little bit of flexibility in your proteins might help maintain function. Uh, and then just thinking a bit more on the, on the physiology. So um, thinking about cells surviving under really long, like for really long time, for a really long time under really suboptimal uh, conditions. So there's this idea of dormancy, kind of like hi a hibernating bear, you know, they, they hide out in their cave until the spring comes or conditions are, are good again. Um, but these cells are still subjected to background radiation that's hitting our planet at all times. There's all sorts of mutational forces that you can only hibernate for so long. Uh, and so um, there's some thought that maybe a better adaptation or a better life strategy, rather than going into a state of dormancy and waiting who knows how long until conditions get um, nice again, uh, is to just have a really slow uh, or low metabolic rate of activity. So really only exert enough energy to maintain your cellular function, to repair DNA uh, as it mutates, um, and really just kind of coast on the bare minimum uh, until you know you get that flux of nutrients, perhaps from a wedding event, uh, or you know conditions get warm, or or something like that. And so that's kind of what we've been thinking about uh, recently. It's a really interesting question um, that I think about a lot, and it doesn't have an answer. But I think your question really really honed in on on kind of the the fun parts of that of that organism. Yeah, and Jackie, a, a follow up to that, because uh, you sort of touched, I think, on this next question by Sylvia Batista, where, where Sylvia is talking about the difference between the active versus the dormant microbes. And, uh, you know, how long can these things remain dormant before they can be reactivated? And, and what are the constraints on those aspects of those uh, uh, communities? If you want to touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I don't know that we know the answer for, for just how long. Um, I know that at least one paper that suggests it might be as long as a million years. Um, this is uh, Sarah Johnson has a paper in PNAS, I think it was 2006, um, but that may be a, a good reference uh, to check out for that. Um, but, you know, I think it'll really kind of uh, depend on things like those mutational forces. How many mutations can a DNA um, can DNA have before that cell is no longer viable? Um, or you know, its mutations are random. Uh, it hits a critical gene that that cell can no longer replicate. Um, so, so I think it part of it is is going to be random uh, as well as what mutational forces may may be subjected to even dormant microorganisms. So even that spore state is still subjected to a lot of harsh uh, conditions. Yeah, yeah, right on. 
Uh, here, here's a question for, for Gemma from Abigail Jackson. Um, she's asking about the, the CO1 marker that you use for Kalimbala, and if you might choose another marker uh, to, and that would be appropriate for answering the questions that you'd answer. And if you did, like, like would that re change your results or change the interpretation or any, anything like that? You want to take that, Gemma? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think um, on one hand, you have already a lot of global knowledge about um, mitochondrial mutation rates, specifically for Kalembola. And this, is, um, this was useful for us because we wanted to apply this molecular clock calibration um, based on um, yeah, the, the mutation rate in mitochondrial DNA, which occurs faster than the nuclear DNA. Um, but sure, it would be great to go back and have another look at some of these interesting locations and do a more deep genome comparison, like maybe look for SNPs or um, yeah, differences in function, like if these guys are using different genes or exactly um, what other aspects of the genome are different or is it just the mitochondrial marker? So yeah, really good question. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, the next question by Adrian Crew is a really good one and a hard one that I think all, I'm hoping all our panelists can speak to. And um, that has to do with um, uh, uh, the climate change. I'm sorry. And, and it has to do with um, um, how resilient or resistant uh, these communities are to invasive species, if I'm interpreting that correctly, Adrian. So as these non-native species move in, how resistant or resilient are these the existing communities to invasion? And, and um, uh, if, if somebody wants to take a crack at that one. I can, I can kick us off and then uh, hand over to the others to add some more comments. Um, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there, Adrian. This is, this is a topic that we talk a lot about in Antarctica because invasive species and not native species are kind of considered to be one of the primary threats to biodiversity in the continent. Um, and when we're talking about like the resilience of the heterogeneity and I guess like the diversity and abundance of different species and spatial distributions and things like that, um, we've got a lot of hypotheses around how non-native species might impact them. Um, and I think Byron and I both talked about some of them, like the potential for communities to become more homogeneous as uh, non-native species come in. Uh, but I think the, the primary answer at the moment is that we don't fully understand what the impacts will be. But some of the things we think might see happening is that non-native species may outcompete native species. Um, and not only kind of non-native species, but as native species start to move around with like this increasing water availability and increasing connectivity, they might start to compete with each other. Uh, you can imagine that lots of these communities have been isolated, as kind of Gemma was saying, for a very, very long time. And so we don't really know what's going to happen when their counterparts come in and start interacting with them. And kind of as Claudia was saying about kind of, you know, the, the facilitation, and we know it's like kind of glacial retreat that new ice-free areas are becoming available, mosses and lichens are facilitating the movement of native species in, but we're also starting to see non-native species crop up in these environments as well, both in terms of invasive spring towels and kind of invasive plants. So I think there's definitely a huge risk from like competition and things like that, but we don't fully know at a broad scale what's gonna happen, but maybe some of the others have some examples that kind of on a species level scale and things like that. I, I really do like this question as well. Um, it's a really good one. I think it's really difficult for us to capture resilience in the first place, um, because in general, when we when we think about these organisms, they they seem to be incredibly resilient. So they they are stuck under the snow for a long time in the year. Then they come up in the summer. They are baked in the heat uh, under very very intense UV light. Um, and then just a few weeks later, they are back in minus 20, minus 40. So as such, they are generally quite resilient over a very broad range of conditions. But I think the actual response amplitude for their physiology is very, very narrow. So they, they really only just operate optimal over a very tiny bit of um, natural or environmental conditions. Now, the question is what happens if this the overall climate 
and, and, and environmental background is changing gradually. And if other species are coming in that operate over a wider range, so can then they make use of the slightly more moderate conditions that come along with climate change and therefore outcompete others that can only operate over this very, very tiny um, um, response amplitude width. So I think, I think uh, there's a general concern about um, more generalistic. So these are these, op uh, these um, species that operate over a broad range of conditions are uh, outcompeting the specialist species of Antarctica. But I think there's very little evidence about that at the moment. And that simply just is a result of that. We've said before, we don't know very much about biotic interactions in the Antarctic as such. So um, we are still understanding this and then we can go on and try to make predictions for the future. Yeah, I mean, many of the organisms that we study have some, some of them have pretty high dispersal rates. I'm thinking some of the wind dispersed nematodes, uh, certainly the microbes. And so we tend to think that the harshness of these habitats really is what's driving their ability to become established, the physical aspects, the physical drivers of these aspects. And um, we've shown that the nematode worms that we've looked at genomically, uh, they constitutively express all of these stress-related proteins and things. And we think that as uh, non-native nematodes might move into this habitat, uh, they might be able to outcompete them if they no longer have to persist in a harsh, in, in a habitat that's quite so harsh. Yeah, following up on Claudia's point that she made. You're on mute, Byron. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, uh, Adrian, for that uh, terrific question. Uh, the next question here is from Rob Ney, uh, asking about if there's, if there's, if you, we would predict that there would be significant biodiversity loss, uh, and if that loss would be related to climate change. This is a very good question and it's something um, I've certainly thought a lot about and had, had discussions with colleagues about it. And uh, will we expect to see populations decline and abundances change? Definitely, yes. I mean, we're already starting to see that even in the dry valleys as kind of we've been talking about already and in terms of like population abundances changing elsewhere too, but will we see kind of species being lost? I think the general consensus is in this century, probably not. I mean, I think most of there's, it's unlikely for most Antarctic species to go extinct kind of in this century, at least, except for maybe, you know, emperor penguin and potentially other kind of uh, charismatic vertebrates. But in terms of the soil biodiversity, I don't, I don't think we're going to see that. I think we're going to start seeing changes in abundances and distributions and kind of diversity of species, but who's to say whether you know that trend will continue beyond kind of the end of this century if climate change continues as it is. Maybe I can also throw one more um, thought into this question. Um, so for example, one of the Kalimbala that we found um, had basically three species in one. So like it depends what you consider as a species and what you already know about the biodiversity and um, yeah, gathering those baseline infos before you can detect whether it's changing. Um, yeah. So I think now maybe we're getting there with some of these kind of methods and techniques. And um, well, from the Kalimbala point of view, we did a pretty thorough search of what's there. But of course, um, yeah, it takes a lot to go actually in and find them. So how many how frequently should we be monitoring and all these questions come, come up too. Very good point, Gemma, I agree. We are still, we are still in the exploring phase, I think. Uh, it, it seems like species numbers are still going up because our technology is improving and we have a different understanding of what we identify as a species and, 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 and we, are, we are still in that um, phase. And, and hopefully we're not seeing any of those um, extinct before we even find them. Right, that's the problem. <laughs> A big problem. 
Yeah. Uh, thanks for that uh, question, Rob. That's a great one. The, the next question we'd like to toss out here is for Gemma, specifically from Thomas Bolger, uh, suggesting that there is evidence for some large scale over snow migration patterns in the Arctic and subarctic Kalimbala. Wondering if you have any observations uh, in, in the Antarctic species of something like that. Yeah, really cool point. So, um, um, snow fleas, uh, I, I think if you Google it, it's maybe some hy hypogastrura species. And we have also a hypogastrura that occurs in the Antarctic. But as far as I know, there hasn't been any um, observations of them actually um, moving across or being found like on the top of the glacier. Um, I don't know, Byron, if you've ever seen, or, but, but my comment would be, um, the problem in Antarctica is that the air itself is so dry and when they get up on the glacier, I don't know if they would survive. So even if you find it there, uh, how do you know that it would actually be able to get across and carry on and find a suitable habitat on the other side? Um, yeah, but that's a really nice point too, because I think this is North America side of Arctic. Yeah, what was the question? Arctic and sub subarctic. Hmm. Maybe different species have, I don't know what adaptations they need to be able to cross the glacier. Yeah, or, or maybe they have different uh, methods to be uh, like for, foresty, right? Maybe, maybe there's other foretic methods for them to move across, the, you know, if, in, in these regions of Antarctica, right? We, we really don't have any above ground animals that could be involved in foresty in, in these regions, right? So there's, there really aren't any like birds that would pick them up and take them someplace or mammals or things like that. And that might also play a role. If, if you knew, Thomas, if what the mo mode of transport was, then that might also inform why we don't see it very much here in Antarctica. We, we do have aeolian collectors. So we have these samples that sample stuff that's blown in the wind. And, uh, you know, we find microbes and even nematodes and things like that in them, but we've, we've never found any uh, microarthropods in any of our aeolian samples. So we, we don't. Yeah, I, I, sorry. Um, yeah, because we also had a look at this too in a few different locations and we didn't find any, any springtails or mites in these um, wind sock collections. We did find them floating down the stream though. So we have proved the idea of that we, they can disperse on the water. And also we said maybe for the human mediated transport, you should clean your boots before you get on the <laughs> helicopter and go somewhere else. So I was kind of advocating for this point too. <laughs> Sorry to jump over you there, Byron. You, you hadn't finished your comment. No, I had finished. Yeah, Th thanks. Thanks, Gemma. Um, Osmond's got a, a general question here, um, and uh, maybe uh, I'm going to toss this to Jasmine first, but like, what, what are the causes for the change in the snow patterns, the changes in patterns of snowfall that are predicted to occur? Like, like how, how, how does that work? Why would we predict there would be increased snowfall in some of these regions? I think this is, well, I mean, what's causing increasing precipitation, I guess that's like kind of broad scale climate movements, but I mean, a lot of, one of the primary factors for driving snowfall across kind of coastal regions today is like big wind pushing it out from the Antarctic plateau. So kind of you might get increased precipitation in the interior and then it's kind of pushed out to the coast via these kind of big wind mechanisms, particularly like catabatic winds and things like that. So with climate, we're expecting wind patterns around the continent, especially around the coast to change. And we're starting to see this already, especially around the peninsula. So I think that kind of is one of the mechanisms for changing precipitation patterns is actually changing wind. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but feel free to add some more, some more details if yeah. yeah th thanks for that, uh, Jasmine. Um, Cecilia's uh, got a, a question here for Claudia and the rest of the panel. Um, Claudia, you mentioned the importance of establishing these knowledge baselines, and we've got some of these long-term ecological experiments that have been going for a while. Um, do you engage in policymaking? Do, do we, as scientists working in Antarctica, engage in policymaking processes, and, and what are the challenges or perhaps uh, positive experiences that you've encountered along the way? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, I think we try. It's really tricky sometimes to bring our science into policy. Uh, a lot of the complication I think there is with the way we communicate and the way we, we operate in as almost separate and, and, uh, and type uh, entities. Um, 
but especially for Antarctica, I think we have um, clear pathways of how we can communicate our science and how we can bring this into um, uh, policy making. This particular study I was referring to is um, just about to be published, so it has not been recognized so far yet. Um, but we are trying to bring this up to the um, SCAR conference, which is going to happen in August. SCAR is the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research, and they have direct relations into, into um, policy making. So if we manage to get our science um, um, presented at these conferences, there's often um, relatively good possibility for us to actually influence policy making in the long run. I don't know if the others on the panel have other opinions on that. Um, it's, I think that's one, one of the key things we need to make sure for, um, for our science and for future that what we're doing is not just something that we're doing for us because it interests us, but it has to have an impact in policy in the long term. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Thanks, um, thanks, Claudia. I think um, I think you're spot on. I think there is good routes for Antarctic scientists to like kind of uh, kind of engage with policymakers through a, a through a kind of a couple of different systems. But our primary source is probably, as Claudia said, is SCAR, so the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research. And in fact, they have got a new kind of scientific research program, which are these really broad programs kind of dedicated to Antarctic conservation and really trying to facilitate important and relevant research to policymakers. So they have a lot of SCAR scientists that work really closely with the Antarctic Treaty System. And so SCAR is one access route for all scientists, but we can also work through our own national program. So whether that's, you know, the British Antarctic Survey or the US program or Antarctica New Zealand, we kind of can talk to policymakers within our own programs about anything that we think is important for policy, whether that's kind of establishing baseline monitoring or, uh, you know, if that's new kind of information available at sea level rise and stuff. And so I think that is good access routes for us to get our information into policy. It's just we certainly need to make people more aware of them. Um, but I think in this day and age, we're starting to think about it more and more. Part of the question that uh, that Cecilia is asking is if, if if we've had any positive experiences. Have any of you had any of your work be taken up and have it, have it translated into policy? If, if so, could anybody speak to that? Um, I, I can certainly say that I have. So that uh, ice-free area work we talked about before in terms of increasing connectivity in new ice-free areas was translated into an information paper for the Antarctic Treaty. And I've had other work looking at like conservation planning and things like that, that has also been kind of uh, translated for the Antarctic Treaty meetings. So I think I've had very positive experiences engaging with policymakers and certainly some, a lot of the policymakers are also scientists. So they're really accessible when you know who to speak to. And so kind of hopefully with these new SCAR programs like Anticon, uh, they'll be more accessible to the whole community. And I think it's just getting the word out there that people want to talk to you about your research and we'll be happy to help you kind of translate into Antarctic policy. Uh, thanks, Jasmine. Uh, on that super uh, positive uh, uh, comment there, uh, we've uh, pretty much used up all our time and we've uh, addressed all of the questions. And so I think I'm going to turn this, do I turn this back over to you, Diana, at this point? Um, I think we've had a chance to answer most of these questions that have been that have been tossed our way, and that's always the best part <laughs> for me for, of these conversations. I love the Q and A's. That's the best part. But, Thank you all for being here. It's great to see the future Antarctic women uh, in this panel too. I've got to give a big shout out for that. It's a big change from years and years ago when there were so few of us there. It's really been a very good scientific seminar, and I hope uh, you all have enjoyed it as much as I have. Have a good summer. Bye-bye. Please join us in the fall for more webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Byron, for sharing. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. For yes, thank you, everyone. That was great.